Alan Morrow, who's travelled all the way from Montreal in Canada yesterday to join us, uh, to tell us a little bit about some of the exciting research he's doing. Um, Alan has got wide interest in the field, but uh, he's going to concentrate a bit today on some of the, his work on some of the molecular findings, which look very exciting, involving micro-ribonucleic acids uh, in the circulation. So thank you very much, Alain, firstly for coming, and secondly for introducing this exciting new uh, epigenetic topic for us. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Holgate, for your kind invitation, as well as uh, the team. This is a very uh, wonderful conference, so it's my pleasure to be here today. Um, there's many things that we can talk about in me, and a lot that are not. Uh, discover yet. So I will talk about circulating microRNA, which is uh, a new beast uh, in the playground of MECFS that could be of some interest. Here are my disclosure. First of all, I'm a newcomer in, into the field of uh, MECFS. I've been attracted by friends and family that push me in and I find it very fascinating and uh, to uh, Use a, a sentence that my dear friend Professor Davis in Stanford used to say, MECFS is probably the last 21st century medical enigma. And we need to pay attention for that. I'm being supported by the CBLISA Foundation and also I received grant for the uh, Kensington Institute of Health Research to uh, organize recently our first collaborative uh, team research conference in Montreal in last May. So, and this, my work that we'll present you today is supported by uh, the ATIC board with a specific protocol being approved. So, I will talk about the current challenges that we are facing together, as well as the description of our Quebec MECFS cohort, which is, by the way, the largest in Canada. I was surprised, I just started three years ago. And I will uh, share with you unpublished data about uh, what we have found about the circulating microRNA and also the new way to generate stress-activated circulating microRNA. And I, I will uh, end up with the next step. So what do we know and not know uh, about the etiology of MECFS? First of all, a lot of things. So we know that a lot of patients have a healthy face, healthy life exactly as Nina just described. And they often face some, or encounter some triggers events, all a lot of uh, viral infection of bacteria, but also could be also associated with some uh, chronic exposure to different chemicals. And what is unclear, although uh, there are some family history of ME, so we are suspecting a genetic predisposition for the disease. And some patients really also uh, were lucky to have a remission for some time, very long period. But they also relapsed. And, and what also uh, triggered the interest is whether there are also some disease modifier and repeat infections or exposure to different chemicals that also will lead to disease progression. So this is so far what we are understanding. And I can use the same slide for any other complex diseases. What is also particular to MECFS is this gene environment interaction. Gene environment interaction in MECFS is very, very important. We cannot overlook that. Because we are studying from genes to mRNA to protein to metabolite and all together that generate what we, we call in science a phenotype. So why you are sick like, like that? What you are developing this and that symptoms. This is your phenotype. We add also recently the microbiome. So you have a lot of billions of micro, uh, microorganisms in your, uh, in your saliva or intestine that can also behave differently in response to uh, uh, the environment. So we cannot just rely on genomics or genetics. Why? And this simple example I'm sharing with you today is the caterpillar and the butterfly. If I extract pure gen genomic DNA from both uh, species here, okay, you will see the same, because they are technically the same. But the phenotype, the hand product, is not the same. 
So we need to understand that, and we know that the caterpillar will become a butterfly to, to change in the environment, because in the cocoon there will be some different hormones and different heat and different things that will trigger some genes and turn off other genes. So you guys, suffering of me, you are a caterpillar and a butterfly. That's a good image, you are a butterfly. So we need to understand that, so we cannot neglect the interaction gene and environment, and there are tools for that today, to address that. Speaking about tools, so this graph describes the complexity and also what we can learn from different omics approach. So if you are looking about genomics, we, are, we know today that we have in our body about 22,000 genes. And those genes will be uh, transcribed in about 150,000 transcripts, so the messenger RNA that will have different form and types, will lead to the production of proteins, so what we refer to proteomics, which is about one million protein. Why we have more proteins than genes is because they are translated by different promoters, they have some different splicing events that have different form of the same proteins, and they also they have some what we refer to post associational modification. So we add different uh, chemicals like phosphate that will inactivate or increase the activity of some of the protein. And we end up with the smaller part of metabolomics, about 2,500 metabolites, so very, very small molecules uh, that leads to what we are. So how can we discriminate? So of course the complexity is increasing toward the metabolomics, but also from the genomics is a kind of promises. What could happen? You may have a mutation, a rare variant, but you are not sick or you're not sick yet, we don't know. What is happening is if you have a less of protein, often you have a less of the messenger really that leads to that protein, so what is this is really happening? So it's more an immediate result. Proteomic is probably what is causing MECFS, like any complex disease. If you have a change, you have abnormal proteins, abnormal accumulation, your protein is, is there, but in the wrong cellular compartment, you may be in trouble. And also metabolomic is often the end result of all those reactions. I'm not saying that some small molecules are not causing ME, it's possible, but often will be just the reflection of what is happening at the end. So it's even more complicated if I bring you to your single atom and say, hey, you have more magnesium. Okay, what, why? And is it wrong or, or, or right to have more magnesium or more uh, homocysteine or other small metabolites? So really, we need to address everything. And speaking about addressing everything, I mean, CFS is really the elephant in the room. <laughs> I'm sure you have seen that cartoon before. I'm not using this cartoon to laugh about scientists or clinicians. I'm using that cartoon just to depict, to describe a reality. The bad news is, linked to this elephant in the room is our technological choices too often blind us of other possibility. If you are a Trump expert, you will look at the Trump on all the ways possible, but you miss the other part of the elephant. If you are a specialist that speaking about metabolomics, sometimes you won't have the same language that you can share with dermatologists, with GPs, or with other clinicians. And of course, wherever you are looking and with very sophisticated tools, those tools are more expensive. And we heard that it's very difficult to get funding in UK, Canada is the same, and even in the United States, so, and even across Europe. So, so the limited funding will have an impact on the choice of the technologies, and also that will lead often to study with small cohort, which a big nonsense. Why? Because the big clinical heterogeneity of MECFS. And a lot of studies have been published by well-established researchers with 12 patients. Even if you spend $100,000 or pounds on 12 patients over a year, you will have the result that could be important for these 12, but that would be impossible if you have to deal, let's say, with four or five different subgroups among those 12. 
So that's the dangerosity of lacking funding. We need more funds for, for, for sure, and that will lead for all the reasons above a lack of reproducibility. The good news, we're covering the whole elephant. And that's why collaborative research is important. The elephants are difficult to travel. We cannot assess and see all the same patients. But samples can travel, data can travel, knowledge can travel. So that's why collaborative research is the key ingredient to be successful to decode MECFS. <laughs> These days, there are a strong desire to establish collaborative effort, and this event today is a proof of that. And also, the tide is uh, changing. Major granting agencies in Europe, UK, have been told that and also in Canada are uh, really interested to launch new funding incentives for that. So uh, timing is everything, but I think we are, this event arrived at the right moment. But as I told you, we are dealing with different type of elephants. By the way, I'm working in a pediatric hospital, so that's why you see this funny cartoon, okay? So, so there is some uh, side effect of working in a pediatric hospital. So we have to deal with different elephants, and we need to recognize that. Not just clinically speaking, but scientifically speaking. So that's why the size of the cohort is very important. So the issue about how to select and compare is, of course, a lot of research has been based on clinical definition, and there is no test. So we are lacking real clinical definition. So you, you, we are using Fukuda, Canadian, and other international standard to try to put you a tag, oh, you are ME or you are not an ME. So this is different and that would change because if we use the standard, the clinical standard from the past, present, and maybe the future, your cohort may already change. Small cohort is, is very dangerous. We are also to address the changes that can be linked to different ethnic backgrounds, and also the fact that we are also assessing the same patient, not really the same patient, but with different omic approaches. So which is the best one? I would say the best one will be to have every, all the techniques available for all the patients. But we have to be more pragmatic at some point. That's why, again, collaboration is important. ME is also occurring in aging population, which means you will not find pure ME disease state. So there will be some comorbidities, so that will be ME plus osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, also some cardiovascular conditions, cancer, so a lot of things that will go on. So we need to address that plus the fact that ME patients, in particular, are using different medications. In our courts, we have patients taking nine different medications. So I cannot remove the nine medications at the time of the test. So I need to find ways to neutralize, or at least to integrate all these information and effects. Plus the fact that there are differences between male and females. Women are more often Amy than males, like a lot of musculoskeletal diseases. So we need also to understand that and also the influence of aging on Amy. Plus, all the triggers in the environment, virus, bacteria, uh, chemicals, stress. One funny thing recently, Professor Davis presented data about the, viral, the number of virus present in Amy and control. And he discovered there are more vir virus in control than in Amy. So I'm not saying that you develop ME or, or the viral infection is not important. It's probably highly important. But again, it depends what are you chasing and if you chase something that happened 20 years ago, it's maybe too late. And we should look maybe about whether or not the virus is now not circulating in your body, but maybe integrated in your genome and doing all other funny things in the regulation of some of your genes. So this is a unknown part that we should, we should look. So, as a newcomer and as a scientist, we developed some hypothesis to 
address the disease. And one of the hypotheses that we put forward is the fact that we believe that AB is caused by a disturbance in the expression of small non-coding molecule called microRNA, which modulate immune function, energy metabolism, and physiological stress response. And we really believe that microRNA could be the missing link between environmental factor, genetic predisposition, and phenotypic difference observed in ABCFS because they are subjects to overexpress or be less expressed in response to different environmental factors. Pick up your favorite one, the microRNA will, will respond. So the primary objective of this research is to identify circulating microRNA that will be linked to the disease or the disease stage and also the disability of some of the major symptoms of ME-CFS across the cohorts and to better understand the etiology of ME to determine the molecular epigenetics, so this is what is happening when gene and environment are considered, and the genetic mechanism associated with the disease. So if we have a better understanding about what is causing the disease, how can we stratify patients, we can find more personalized solution and treatment for patients. So let me just summar summarize what are the microRNA. They are very small. 20 to 22 nucleotide, so very, very short stretch of ribonucleic acid. And when they are produced, they have a tendency to recognize specific site at the end of some messenger RNA that will be attached, and doing that, that would prevent the translation of this messenger RNA and have an impact, an impact on the production of protein. And one single microRNA can target up to 200 different genes. And one gene can be targeted by more than one microRNA. So very small, very powerful, and we need to pay attention about what they are doing because they can make you sick. So a lot of research about microRNA has been done in cancer, cardiovascular disease, and other muscular disease. So they are not only possible useful biomarker, but they can be a target. There are ways to remove microRNA in your body, and there are drugs that can also modulate the expression of microRNA. So, very interesting and fascinating uh, small molecule. Here is the cohort that we use for uh, the development uh, of our research on microRNA. So, today we are probably, the right number could be about more than 200 MECFS patients. We are targeting the severe ones, so which means that all of them, or most of them, are homebound. I have to send a clinical nurse at home to do the test, so which I think more relevant to address the more severe symptom and the more severe mechanism. And of course, we need to establish the reference value of those circuiting mechanisms using a healthy subject, which is not a trivial task because we have a test about one hour and a half. So two hours after the, the completion of questionnaire, it takes forms. So who is willing during the day to skip two hours of their working day to pass the test? So we need, we need to have men and women healthy that are willing to help uh, the patients. So here is the, the test. So you have the number that we, we use to test. And we develop something, a very, very, very easy test. First of all, the test is using a portable machine that you can see here. And is uh, using an inflatable cuff that is doing a massage. So it's a messenger machine that have been approved by uh, Santé Canada, Health Canada for that, and is not stressful, the patient is at rest at home, and we draw blood at baseline before the test and every 30 minutes during the test. And this test, and you see 0 0.006 Earth at zero to four PSI, is nothing. Okay, a cuff to take your blood Okay, that will block your, your artery is about 30 PSI. Okay, it's hurt. But this is enough to create a stress on the patients. And of course, we test that, it's, it's very safe. 
because my goal is not to call 911 every time that the nurse is at home and we need an ambulance to bring back the patient at home. So we have to uh, develop something that can be applicable and also will generate a kind of test. Here is the workflow that we use for the discovery cohort. So of course we start with a small group of patients in control. And we obtain the plasma, we prepare the microRNA, we establish a profile, so this is the type of color that you see different expression for different microRNA, and we end up with a group of 32 circulating microRNA. Those are our prime suspect. Of course, because we are using a biochip from Agilent, those chips are not normally used in a clinical setting. So that's why the, 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 the next step we, we used was to use a qPCR, so a quantitative PCR method to address that. So what's new with that method is for the very first time, each patient become, becomes his own control. So I don't need to care if he's using nine medication or he's on specific diets or whatever. So I cannot remove that from the equation, but that test each patient become its own control. So we show that patient exhibit a distinct molecular footprint at baseline and after stimulation. And we saw often after stimulation, the stimulation reveal the real face of the disease as opposed to patients at baseline or at rest. And that's why we discovered what we refer to stress activated circulating mediator that are more specific and informative about MECFS. And I remind you that machine is portable. So the test can be done everywhere. And the machine is not that expensive. We're not talking a, about a spec scan or something like that. So for the validation, we use the remaining part of the cohort. Okay? And again, same principle. We use the plasma. We have to what we refer to do as spike in preparation. Because microarena are regulating so many other genes including sometimes older microRNA, so we cannot use an uh, internal standard to, to control for variation. So we use a cell again, so an artificial microRNA, to uh, establish a reference value. And we end up with qPCR, which are now accepted in clinical setting for clinical diagnosis. So again, we need to address and use the tools to have some leverage to penetrate the clinical field if we want to allow people to use a test. We need to plan that from the beginning. It's easier than if you have a sophisticated tools, but nobody can understand the machine or buy the machine. This is a machine using for different other tests. So I will not explain the 32 microarena for the time because you will be fed up of me. <laughs> but I will show you some of them to convince you that we are probably on the right track. First, I will talk about the MIR 127 3P. So they have this type of name. This MIR has been previously discovered and reported in the Australian cohort. So when we pick that one, we say, okay, we are probably on the right track. And this is the first replication uh, analysis. And I know that Canada and Australia is a bit far apart. But we are not that different in terms of Amy. So this is a bit reassuring that we are, at least one of the microRNA is, is more elevated uh, in Canadian and Australian as well. The MIR 127 3P negatively regulate a gene called BCL6, which is known to uh, inhibit, amongst other, uh, interleukin 10 genes. And that's gene code for a cytokine that has been found elevated in cerebrospinal fluid of MECFS patient. So a relevant microRNA, a relevant target. And you see here the results. So those are the whole ME patients together versus the control at baseline and the ME patient after stimulation and control after stimulation. And on the B panel, you see what we use, what we call a ingenuity pathway analysis where you can see that your microRNA is identified the target and the target is known to identify interleukin 10. So there are other targets, but that type of analysis can open. So if in the room we have people that are thrilled about interleukin 10, 
you have a prime suspect that regulates term, term, uh, italic intent here. One or another uh, microarena that is a bit, a bit fascinating for us is MIL 145P. You can see that is highly elevated for older ME, a group of ME at baseline, as opposed to the control, and you see the difference also after the simulation. And what is very interesting about that one is it's targeting a gene called C CD20, which is a target of rituximab. C220 is expressed at the uh, surface of lymphocyte B, and this is where rituximab is kill the lymphocyte B, or deplete the lymphocyte B using this receptor. Now, one of the problems that you can see is if I overexpress this microRNA, the target of rituximab will disappear. This has been known and noticed in cancer and could explain why rituximab is not work working in many, at least in some of uh, MECFS patients. This is probably very important. Again, we are dealing with different types of elephants. So if you know that you are a high 145P elephant, I won't treat you, I shouldn't treat you with rituximab. But if you have a low one, maybe rituximab can be very effective for you. That's changed completely at this a clinical trial design, knowing that. So this is not, again, this is my warning side. This is not a full proof. But this result, and I will present next week to uh, Hausching Flu, I think he will jump from his seat when he see it. You are the first one so seeing that, okay? <laughs> So, very promising, very exciting, okay? 155, oh, by the way, if you look about those microRNA, because I know you guys, that you will go right away on PubMed, especially with our, our Google, uh, uh, Google Scholar, you will see that none of those microRNA are disease-specific. Okay, I'm not saying that we will find out a one specific one. It's impossible, probably because we are dealing with a complex disease. So don't, don't send me an email saying, hey, Dr. Moreau, this is not disease specific. I know it. <laughs> and I know you guys because you are already watching what I'm saying. But we saw that higher uh, expression is detected in stimulated patients compared to control. And what is very interesting is when we look about the different questionnaire that's being completed by our patients, we saw that the patients that have a very high expression of this microRNA have a better mental health. They have a better mental score. So, very, very interesting. So, one question I asked to my team is why? And the why came from this EPA analysis that this mere 155P is targeting a gene called SLC6A2, which is a molecule, a, a, a multipass membrane protein that is responsible for the reuptake of norepinephrine in presynaptic nerve. And doing that type of research, we rediscover the work of Arnold et al. They published the use of a drug that can target the very same genes called s -dulect duloxetin and the study if you look at that study they end up with the same conclusion this drug has no effect on the primary endpoint what which was fatigue but seems to have very uh, uh, strong efficacy to improve mental health of patients so different approach different clinical setting different cohort and we indirectly prove they were right, that this is indeed seems to have an, an impact by targeting the very same genes. Again, if you are a high pro producer of this microRNA, you don't need to take dulexetin because you will have probably, your mental health will be improved right away. 
same story, different elephant, different symptom. So we can, now can do more targeting approach to achieve that. The last two slides will be more provocative if it's not enough for you again. <laughs> One of these uh, mycoena called 20, uh, uh, 374B5P. And this exp the expression of this mycoena being uh, showed very low in women suffering of fibromyalgia related disease. And the level of this mycoena is inversely, inversely correlated with pain threshold in fibromyalgia. Interestingly, in Amy, is going in the opposite direction. So it's more expressed, and we just put here, so we compare 62, 68 F FM patients to Amy at baseline, and you see the big difference as opposed to control. So this is very intriguing because we have a, a microarena going in the opposite direction. We know there's less pain in ME than fibromyalgia. And now we may have the tools to select more clearly, at least at the molecular level, FM from ME using that. And of course, if you use the same EPA analysis, you see that this microarena can target a lot of things. So it could be linked to cognitive impairment, throat DC, DC2, could be involved in a mitochondrial disorder through this gene. So those are predicted targets. We need to validate them. And we need to check which type of tissue that can be relevant. Interestingly, it's also targeted a gene called TTPA, which is involved in vitamin E transport. So that can be sometimes relevant. We need to explore that. The last one that I will uh, share with you this morning is MIO 4865P. So it's targeting, as being as in, in cancer, with the target genes like P10 and PI3K signaling pathway. But what is also very intriguing is endurance athletes possess higher whole blood level of this mycoena compared to LT control. And this MIO seems to correlate to VO2 max. We know that VO2 max of ME are very low. You lack that capacity. So this is very intriguing. And a lot of researchers in the field compare ME CFF patient as an athlete based on some metabolic marker. But we know that you are not athlete. But you, rela you react like an athlete after a very strong effort, even though that you are doing nothing. We need to understand that. And this is what this mycoena is also indicating to us. So again, it's also associated with different transport of magnesium, cobalt, uh, ferric. Also involved in EGE response. So the allergic link could involve directly or not this mycoena. Also uh, involved in uh, different uh, other functions. So again, we need to explore that in more detail. But I think we are following very promising leads. Uh, that so to understand where we are doing with that, why we are measuring microarena baseline and after stimulation, these tables show that we are dealing with four different subgroup of patients. The number are not important. So if you're in the back, you are not seeing the screen, forget it. It's OK. What is important is, can you see the different colors? So this is a group of patients that share more or less the same response. Where is identified here is the percentage of gain or loss if I compare the response after the stress, the stimulation, and baseline. So blue are positive, and the yellowish one you see a down regulation. So I'm producing less after the stimulation and in blue more after the stimulation. You see that all the patients that we have tested so far, we can compile them in four different subgroups based on the colors that are shared here. You don't need to have a doctorate for Oxford to understand that. <laughs> I hope so. Okay. So, so we are dealing with four different groups of elephant here. This is the meaning of this cartoon, OK? If I look back and ask the patient, 
their response to the test. You see this group also were the most affected. They have a lot of uh, more tired uh, as opposed, and the less affected one is this group. If I ask them additional questions, not based on the questionnaire that say how you were during the last six weeks or six months, but immediately, a few days after the test, the group one is again the more severely affected, with 20% of them report mental fogginess, 20% vertigo, dizziness, which is unique to this group, as opposed to the other group that are different type of symptom. And some of the patients, 24 something overall, have no symptom at all, which is something important for us. So the test is not pushing them. I can change the setting of the machine, obviously, but I don't want to push the 76% in the hospital doing that. So it's, I have to, to select what I, my intent. How can I explain the mental fogginess and vertigo? Of course, we use different markers and we look at the biochemical level and we discover one called thrombospondin 1, which is an anti-angiogenic factor, which will modulate Okay, how your blood vessel will respond. So if I overexpress TSP1, amongst other, I will have an effect and I will create a constriction of your vessel, especially the small one. We had the result before, but we didn't have the classification here. And this group one is the one that really overexpress TSP1 as opposed to the group four or controls. Again, keep in mind my warning. This, these are not fully validated data. But again, the fact that I have something that can constrict your blood vessel could bring you more mental fogginess and vertigo, which make a lot of sense. And we know that a lot of patients have some abnormalities in terms of the brain blood flow. So now we need to explore and check whether those patients have those brain blood flow abnormalities as opposed to this subgroup. So I think this is the value of what we are proposing this morning in terms of the test can give you a new illumination what, what is happening at the biochemical level, what is happening in terms of molecular stratification of MECFS patient, because they are not the same. And for the very first time, because we, are, we may agree one day, maybe not this morning, but one day, <laughs> that the test can be combined with other, if you look about the genetics, if you look about whatever your favorite molecules, you may rediscover something that makes a lot more sense for the patient and for the clinicians. So what are the next steps? We need, of course, to validate the remaining circuiting mechanism that we have discovered, but on larger MECFS cohort. We also would like to replicate, replicate, and replicate. Those are key words, very important to establish the relevance and also not only in Canadian, but also in other cohort across the world. And of course, we hope that we can work together in a very collaborative manner. So in conclusion, I would like to acknowledge the patients and the community that are helping us to do these uh, studies, especially the Quebec Association, the Canadian National Association, my uh, sincere thanks to the uh, Sibylla SA Foundation for their uh, financial support. And also, these are the bees doing the work, okay? <laughs> and, and by chance, it's happening that it's only women, okay? So, so women dominates my lab, so many thanks to my team. And I look forward to receiving your question. Thank you very much. Thank you.